We're interested in economic development. We measure that in shorthand as the gross domestic product per person. But we've noted that the variation in incomes across households within a country, across individuals within a country, can be very large. So we have to take into account not only the average level of income, but the inequality of income within a country. You all know the famous quip of uh, the man uh, whose feet are in fire, whose head is on ice, and he's asked, how's the temperature? He says, on average, it's fine. But of course, it's devastating with the inequality of fire and ice. And societies can be like that also. On average, income can be just fine. But if income is just fine because a few people are fantastically rich and the rest of the country is excruciatingly poor, it's not so fine after all. And so in addition to measuring the average level of development as the gross domestic product per person, we want to find ways to measure the inequality of income within the country. There are several indicators that are used. We can look at the ratio of incomes of those at the top of the income distribution to those at the bottom. Sometimes we look at the uh, income of the top 20% of the population compared to the income average of those in the bottom 20%, the poorest 20% of the population. Another uh, measure that is quite useful, a uh, little bit fancier, is a measure called the Gini coefficient. It's a measure that varies between 0 and 1. 0 meaning complete equality. Everybody has the same income. And one is exactly the case of one person in the country having everything. You know, the king, the, the potentate. Uh, he owns everything. And everybody else is completely impoverished. They have nothing. That would be a Gini coefficient of one. Of course, real societies aren't at zero or at one. They're somewhere in between. Societies that we would regard as rather equal with a broad middle class. Uh, a lot of countries in Scandinavia, for example, have a Gini coefficient uh, around uh, 0.25, uh, whereas countries that are much less equal, uh, where there really is a lot of wealth at the top, but then a lot of poverty alongside it, uh, might have a Gini coefficient not of one, the pure inequality, but a Gini coefficient around 0.5 or 0.6. And so that's the variation. It's an extremely useful measure. We can put it on a map and have a look at where inequality tends to be high and where inequality tends to be relatively low. The lowest inequality tends to be in Western Europe and especially in Scandinavia, as I mentioned. Uh, countries like Sweden, uh, Norway, Denmark, uh, tend to have a relatively equal income distribution, a broad middle class, uh, not so many super rich, and basically no super poor. Uh, and you see on the map uh, the, the light shading of those countries indicates uh, a quite low Gini coefficient. Canada is similar. The United States, if you look uh, just south of Canada, that's uh, shaded in red. The U.S. is quite unequal in income distribution compared with Canada or Western Europe, and especially compared with the countries uh, in Scandinavia. In the United States, we have a lot of super rich, more billionaires than in any other part of the world, and we have a lot of very poor people. Uh, maybe not as excruciatingly poor as one would find in the least developed countries, uh, but relative to the billionaires, uh, poor people in the United States really don't have very much at all. You can see, looking at this map, a very interesting phenomenon that most of the Americas, with the exception of Canada, shaded in red and quite unequal. Uh, the Americas as a whole, both North America and South America,
uh, are relatively unequal societies. Uh, Africa, for the countries where we have the data, also rather unequal. Uh, and uh, in comparison, for example, uh, with uh, uh, India or other parts of Southeast Asia, uh, Africa tends to uh, rank uh, relatively high in inequality. China uh, was quite equal in its poverty uh, 50 years ago, but with a lot of economic development, uh, with a widening of the gap between those living in the urban areas doing rather well and those living in the rural areas uh, remaining still rather poor, the inequalities in China have risen to levels similar to those of the United States. And that means on an international uh, comparative basis, a relatively high degree of inequality. Now, it's interesting to look in a little bit more refined way uh, at this Gini coefficient among the high income countries because it shows us that there are different pathways to economic development. Getting richer doesn't mean necessarily becoming more unequal, uh, nor does it guarantee becoming less in inequality or more equal. There are different pathways for development. Northern Europe has chosen a pathway of becoming wealthier with a lot of social equality. Uh, whereas the United States has been on a path uh, of rising incomes uh, alongside rising inequality. If you look at the Gini coefficient uh, across the high income countries in this bar chart, you see countries like uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden uh, with the lowest Gini coefficients and uh, those with the highest Gini coefficients uh, uh, countries like the United Kingdom, Israel, United States, Turkey, Mexico, uh, and Chile, uh, countries with big gaps between the rich and the poor. How do we explain these gaps? Well, this is a very complicated challenge, and it is, of course, a contentious uh, issue as well. There are many reasons for inequality that we want to uh, direct attention to to make sure that we don't treat such a complicated, uh, challenging, divisive topic uh, in a simplistic manner because history plays a big role, geography plays a big role, government policy plays a big role. Uh, let me mention a few of the causes of inequality or uh, reduced uh, inequality uh, across countries. Traditionally, the size of land holdings made a big difference. Uh, some countries, especially in the Americas, had uh, huge farms, huge haciendas, uh, often taken by the European settlers uh, who came to the Americas. And they often displaced indigenous populations. Uh, they often brought in slaves, uh, actually, to work those large farms. And so while there were some with huge land holdings, there were others that were landless or, or displaced from the land. And in traditional societies where agriculture is so important, the size of land holdings is a crucially important dimension of inequality. Variations in education levels uh, are a very important source of inequality. Uh, those uh, young people who are lucky enough uh, by dint of uh, their own hard work or their family support, usually a combination of the two, to be able to get higher education, uh, that higher education will translate uh, in the modern economy into higher income levels as well. Whereas uh, kids that uh, are uh, unlucky, growing up in very poor families, very poor communities, and aren't able to make it through to higher levels of training, may get stuck with the very low income levels uh, in their employment. So education can become an equalizer if everybody has the opportunity, but it can also become a source of inequality as well. I would mentioned earlier that the rural-urban divide uh, is key. Families that move to urban areas often find uh, better employment prospects and higher incomes. Uh, those uh, left uh, uh, in villages uh, as smallholder farmers often eke out survival uh, in a lot of poverty. Discrimination matters tremendously, of course, still in this world. Women 
uh, all over the world uh, are not given the same chance uh, as men in the labor market. Uh, they don't earn the same incomes even when they're doing the same job or better. Uh, they face uh, discrimination that uh, is deeply entrenched, even though fortunately it is uh, being reduced in, in many places. Uh, racial minorities, uh, ethnic groups that are minorities, uh, religious groups that are minorities often face uh, terrible conditions in the labor market, not able to get education, not able to get the kind of employment that they would deserve if they were treated fairly. Government policies make a huge difference. Corrupt governments that collect big uh, rents on uh, oil holdings or uh, diamond holdings or other uh, mineral deposits in the country and then use <coughs> that income for a very small class of insiders, uh, maybe for those in power, the royal family, the, uh, the uh, politicians, the political class, can create a huge amount of inequality. Uh, often countries that uh, live off of a few mining resources, oil, gold, diamonds, are very unequal because of the ways that uh, that that government revenue is allocated. At the same time, governments can be great equalizers. If governments collect revenues and then ensure that the poor can go to school, that poor people can get access to health care, that everybody has a chance, that poor families are given some income support as they are in Scandinavia to ensure that their children will have a good chance, then governments can narrow the income inequality as well. Let me turn back to why the Americas are relatively unequal. Well, they were settled by conquest. Uh, European settlers took the large land holdings. European settlers brought in slaves. European settlers displaced uh, indigenous populations. Over time, those uh, uh, forces uh, turned into different forces. Uh, the descendants of uh, Europeans today uh, tend to have better educational opportunities. But as democracy has come to the Americas, there's also a very powerful trend of equalization taking place in at least some countries. More kids able to go to school. Governments leaning towards social inclusion rather than away from it as was historically the case. In sustainable development, not only do we try to understand inequality, but we hold it as one of the goals that there should be social inclusion in economic development. And yet at the same time, the forces of politics, the forces of market change, the forces of trade and globalization often favor the rich who are able to use those forces to their advantage so that the rich tend to get richer and the poor even poorer. That's our battle and that's our challenge. Understand the inequalities of income within societies. Find ways, as those uh, impressive societies in Scandinavia have done, to ensure a big middle class and a chance even for a child born into a relatively poor family. And that can become the path to social inclusion, one of the pillars of sustainable development.